Hi, everybody. Uh, first off, I just want to make the announcement that um, we do we will leave time for questions at the end. So uh, please leave anything you might want to ask until then. And um, I'm Trevor Cashery, and uh, if you don't know who I am at this point in the day, I, you're just here for the party, which I respect. <laughs> I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, author Michael F. Flynn, and I should probably do that by reading his official bio. Uh, Michael F. Flynn debuted in Analog with Slon Leave in November of 1984 and has contributed regularly ever since. His story has been nominated for the Hugo Award seven times, most recently for The Journeyman in the Stone House, and won the Theodore Sturgeon Award for House of Dreams. He won the first Robert A. Heinlein Medal for his body of work. His 12 novels include the four-volume Firestar series, the four-volume Spiral Arm series, as well as the Hugo-nominated uh, Eiffelheim and the critically acclaimed The Wreck of the River of Stars. His third collection, Captive Dreams, includes three analog stories and three new stories written for the collection. He's currently working on The Journeyman, a picaresque novel, uh, one's a Picaro, always a Picaro, right? Uh, and The Shipwreck of Time, set in the alien world of 1965, Milwaukee. Uh, 1968. It says 65, Mike. <laughs> 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 it covers several years. Oh, okay, well, I'll buy that. That's possible. Um, weirdly, it doesn't mention that he was uh, briefly this administration's national security advisor, but it didn't interfere with his fiction output. Uh, but anyway, no, that's, that's actually obviously not true. I, just, I really like political jokes that will be super dated within like a year. Uh, I don't know, you probably get that one all the time. Oh, uh, that guy. <laughs> this guy can't go to church now because of that guy. Anyway, uh, what is true is that although he's published in Asimov and FNSF, he's appeared in Analog roughly 60 times, with everything from hard science fiction stories to humorous probability zeros, alternate histories, and straight nonfiction pieces. Oh. And poems. And poems. Yes, that's, that's in here too. He won the <laughs> Annual Readers Award for novellas novelettes, and fact articles. He also, and mind you, this is all stuff I dug out. He was too humble to mention this in his own bio. He also has a Compton Crook Award for Best First Novel, as well as a Seiyun Award, which is Japan's highest honor for science fiction. Uh, I'm told by the Seiyun Award people, though, so I don't know. <laughs> in spite of all that, a couple of years ago, uh, Mike told me a story with, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back that up. Mike sold me a story, which he's had a pretty good track record of. And it was one of the journeyman stories. And I, I had a suspicion that he knew I had a soft spot for that series. There's something about it that is right for the magazine, but it also it just appeals to my particular taste. So with that sus suspicion in mind that he must have had some confidence, I, I emailed him to accept it and to say that I, I hope the acceptance still came as a pleasant surprise. And he said, and I quote, they always are. The day I start taking them for granted is the day I start writing slop then the surprise will not be quite so pleasant. And that, as much as the long history with the track record, uh, long history and track record, uh, stretching over 30 years with the magazine, is why I am honored to present as our keynote speaker, Michael F. After that, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> This is supposed to be a symposium, right? Mm -hmm. Symposium is a banquet. <laughs> Where's the food? <laughs> oh, man. Came all the way out here from Pennsylvania thinking there'd be a big spread of food. <laughs> oh, well. Took three hours to get here. The last hour of which was spent in four blocks of Brooklyn. <laughs> and that was after the GPS told us to go the wrong direction. <laughs> okay. The temptation was strong to introduce this by bringing one of my tin whistles and playing Do in the key of D that being the key note. 
<laughs> but I thought that that might not be sufficiently, uh, have sufficient gravitas. <laughs> so when they asked me to do this, I said, what the heck am I going to talk about? Wouldn't it be better to ask Dr. Schmidt? He knows more about the analog than <coughs> most people. And they said, talk about yourself for 15 minutes, <coughs> then read from a story for 15 minutes, and then have questions. Well, with any kind of luck, we should also have time for answers. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about myself, that was a deadly gauntlet to throw down. Since there is no other subject on which I am better informed. <laughs> okay. How did I get into science fiction, you ask? It would be more pertinent to ask, how did science fiction get into me? <laughs> My father used to tell us bedtime stories when we were like six, seven years old. One of them I remember quite well, about benevolent aliens who visited Earth. And they had a manual to serve man. But it turned out to be a cookbook. <laughs> Good night. Sleep tight. <laughs> Another one. Earthlings go to Mars, and they think they see all their beloved dead relatives in their childhood homes. And they are lured into uh, spending the night in these places. And in the night, the Martians reveal themselves and slaughter them all. Good night. <laughs> Sleep tight. Oh, well, <laughs> Eric could sure tell a good bedtime story. So it was inevitable that as we, I don't want to say matured, <laughs> but as we grew older, we started to write science fiction stories in pencil, in spiral notebooks, liberally illustrated with magic markers, Back in the days when the magic markers contained volatile organic compounds, <laughs> the odors of which may explain a great deal <laughs> about our stories. Oh. Later, Dennis and I, Dennis is my, uh, my two brother, we found Pear's stash of Galaxy and If and learned a little bit later on that he hadn't made those stories up. He had cribbed them. <laughs> what a disillusionment that was. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> About 12 or so, Dennis and I found an old Smith Corona manual typewriter. Let me explain what a typewriter <laughs> uh, never mind. Okay. Uh, the typewriter is still there, by the way, on a little pedestal down in the basement. Okay. On the keys of this infernal device, we pounded out, in honor of Pear's bedtime stories, a very bad imitation of to serve man. <coughs> Parts of that story still exist because my mother saved them. Sometimes you hear writers talk about how their parents discourage them from reading that sci-fi stuff. My parents never did. I suppose I had a happy childhood, but I'll bear up with it. Okay. We were interviewed by the local human interest reporter for the local newspaper. I suppose that would be inhuman interest report. We were called the Space Writing Flynn Brothers. <laughs> and we finished each other's sentences, something which the reporter took note of. As time went on, we recruited two other classmates and laid out an entire history of the future. 
with adventures, generally deadly, on each planet and on those nearby stars. One of our partners, Red Scannell, and myself were known as the Gruesome Tusum, or the slaughter we visited upon these poor, innocent space travelers. <laughs> okay, they're saved, they're in the binder, they're down on my desk, but uh, I'm no longer able to dance down the stairs and fetch them. About a year and a half ago, I suffered a stroke, or you might say, I had a stroke added to my game. So, if I seem sometimes a little bit hesitant, or a little bit wobbly, now you know the reason. My father made an eight millimeter movie, Around the World in 80 Frames, in which Dennis and I played two spacemen. This is before the word astronaut had been coined by people too embarrassed to say spaceman. <laughs> we even wore our pajamas for the film, so we looked like uh, future Star Trek personnel. Okay. We piloted the space station around the world, spotting through our viewer, which was actually a film splicer, but it looked like something you would look into and see what's down on the earth. And we handed up spotting people from orbit. Imagine being able to see individuals from orbit. Uh, Mexico, India, Japan, in each case, the said denizen was played by third bro Kevin, who was a vast five years younger than we were. We tried to point out to Pear that the sequence in which we passed over these countries made no sense in terms of orbital dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> but he was the director and we were only the actors. <laughs> Besides, the denouement was that it was all a dream and so the orbital parameters don't really matter. <laughs> we were really into dinosaurs as well as space travel and had invented an imaginary world with different Saurian countries, drew maps of them, devised their histories, languages, and so forth, which we documented on index cards. It's possible I could still draw the maps. Oh well. Naturally, when we got our library cards, we went through the children's science fiction section like Leaky Through Africa. My first book was Space Captives of the Golden Men by M. E. Patchett. That was Mary Ellen Patchett. You never forget your first one. <laughs> Dennis, I think, checked out The Time Traders by Andre Norton. When we had devoured all the SF in the children's section, Dennis and I approached the librarian in our local branch and asked to check out SF from the adult section. Skeptical, the librarian took a book off the shelves and gave it to Dennis to read, since he was the younger of the two of us by 362 days. <laughs> we were what were called Irish twins. <laughs> the book, fortunately this is before uh, Samuel Delaney wrote Dahlgren. So the book she pulled was actually something that uh, we could read. <laughs> <laughs> it was The Long Tomorrow by Lee Brackett. And he must have done a credible explanation of what was going down in the opening passage, and she gave us permission. In between the Patchett, Norton, Brackett, <coughs> we also read the usual books by Heinlein, Asimov, Clark, DeCamp, Anderson, you name them. My first book from the adult section was the War Against the Rome, 
by A. E. Van Vogt. Time passed. I was in high school. Coming home involved two buses, and the transfer point was at 4th and Northampton Street, Easton, Pennsylvania. There was a bank there, so I would duck into the lobby and check out the magazine rack. One time I noticed a magazine that was clearly science fictional, except that it was full magazine size rather than digest. It was called Anon. Cool. <coughs> the January 1964 issue, to be precise. The cover featured a micron photograph of a specimen of a meteorite, which itself would be unusual for SF magazine, a factual cover. And the stories in it were <coughs> The Eyes Have It by Randall Garrett, which was a detective story set in a parallel universe where magic works, but according to strict scientific laws. Also, Papa Needs Shorts by Walt and Lee Richmond about the use of equivocal words, namely the word shorts. <laughs> Fittingly, the story was itself a short story. There was also Subjectivity by Norman Spinrad and See What I Mean by John Brunner. And part two of a serial entitled Doom World by Frank Herbert. <laughs> so I got dumped right there onto Arrakis in the middle of the action, had no clue what was going on. I got part three, but I never did get part one until years later at a science fiction convention where they were selling back issues of the magazine. I, by then I had read the actual the paperback novel that came out of it. Okay. After that I needed a habit to check in at the newsstand. But that was the year my brother died of cancer. July of 64, so I didn't catch each issue. One of the effects of a stroke is not only do I tend to laugh peremptorily at my own jokes, something that my wife will not do, even, even past emptorily, <laughs> but I also tend to get exaggerated emotions. In August of, 84, of 64, there was a story in the issue entitled Interdisciplinary Conference by Philip P. Giffen. And it was only appearance in the magazine in all history. <coughs> and it was a kind of story at which Analog, at least at one time, excelled. And that was a series of connected vignettes often, uh, in, in some cases, detailing all the unforeseen consequences of a new invention. This one happened to be a series of excerpts or abstracts from technical publications, geography, paleontology, history, also geology, did I say geology? Okay, a whole bunch of different things which the reader immediately stitches together to say, there was an undiscovered civilization in Central Asia that was quite advanced and sophisticated for its time. The last section, all these scholars who had written these articles were brought together into a single interdisciplinary conference in order to pool their knowledge and cross-fertilize with one another. And the result was, they all joked about cross-fertilization, decided there was nothing at all they could have to say to one another, <laughs> and uh, adjourned the meeting without noticing 
that they each had a little piece of a uh, big puzzle. Oh, uh, it scandalized me. I was a kid. <laughs> August of 64 also, frustratingly enough, contained part two of a serial, <laughs> Sleeping Planet, which I never saw part one until years later, et cetera, et cetera. But the frustration was such that I thought, maybe I should subscribe. <laughs> and so I did. That subscription is still going. Nobody has yet suggested I should get like a lifetime. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> grandfather in. <laughs> now, what was analog like in the years when I first started to read it and then subscribe to it? I would have to characterize it as the era of Mac Reynolds, H. Beam Piper, Christopher Amell, and Paul Anderson, who was still appearing regularly. He had been there for a long, long time. Under one name or another, I only found out later that he was also Winston P. Sanders and Michael Cara George. Oh, well. So he was there more often than I thought. 38 times from after my subscription. names to conjure with. Mac Reynolds had placed an analog, or would place an analog, 56 stories. That's counting each part of a serial individual. Sweet Dreams, Sweet Princes was a favorite. Had a great cover. Photojournalist, in which the uh, narrator wonders why this photojournalist who was always there for historical, historically significant events. Why he was there photographing some pedestrian meet and greet with the Soviet minister. Hmm. He also described a milieu in which people purchased items by sticking a card into a slot and their balance would be automatically deducted. No need for cash. Can you believe that? <laughs> and in one of the stories, a bunch of crooks broke into a computer to jigger the totals in their favor. But of course, in those days, they actually had to physically break into a building there the computer was located. Mac uh, Reynolds wasn't quite that far ahead of the time. Each Beam Piper produced the uh, Paratime Patrol stories, and I was there for his last two stories, Gunpowder God and Down Stiphon. Actually, it was Down Stiphon, because there's an <laughs> explanation. <laughs> this was uh, an influential story, or series of stories, because uh, it took place in Pennsylvania, although out around State College in the Nittany Valley. And in this milieu, in this world, the Indo-Europeans, instead of migrating west into Europe, in Indo, had migrated east across the Bering Sea and settled the Americas. So North America is now pockmarked with little semi-Greekish <coughs> kinds of kingdoms. Most of Pennsylvania was the kingdom of, uh, oh, what was it? Ah. But uh, State College in that area was uh, Hostigos. North of that was Nostor. So I occupied myself drawing maps, trying to figure out exactly where each one of these countries were, each one of these pumpernickel principalities. <laughs> so one of the first stories I sold to Analog 
when I found out that you could actually get paid for doing this kind of stuff, <laughs> uh, was uh, Pennsylvania, in which the revolution had succeeded, but the Articles of Confederation had failed, and civil war broke out among the colony states. And uh, in this case, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania was a German-speaking country surrounded by hostile neighbors. <laughs> so there was that influence there. But the mainstay in that era was Christopher Anvil, who specialized in a kind of story in which good intentions and brilliant inventions always go wrong. And one thing leads to another, to another, to another. So, he also uh, played to John Campbell's pet notion of the, uh, in, in other stories, the uh, brilliant earthmen who outwit the aliens who on the surface are far more powerful and dominant. Another high volume contributor in that era was James Schmitz, who gave us the adventures of a 15 year old girl, Telsey Amberton. I was in love with Telsey. <laughs> she was my age. Other long timers still appearing when I began reading included Gordon R. Dixon and his door side. A. Bertram Chandler and his Rim Worlds, and Murray Leinster. Catherine McLean had begun to appear in 1950 and placed 13 stories between then and 1997. Other writers who had made their first appearances in the 50s included Lee Corey, uh, A. Stein, uh, G. Harry Stein memories and other thing. It gives me an excuse when my wife says, did you remember too? Um, <laughs> and the answer is, oh, no. <laughs> Harry Harrison began in 1957. Ben Bova stepped on stage in 1962 and would grace its pages 59 times before 2008. But new authors continued to appear even after I started reading. In the 1960s, we saw a debut of Keith Lammer with his Bolo stories, like Field Test, one of my favorites. Jack Wodums with There Was a Crooked Man. He also did a lot of these vignette sequence stories. The Legal SF of Charles Harness, the Veterinarian SF of Amy Bechtel, then somebody named Stan Schmidt came up. <laughs> and turned the entire earth into a lifeboat. Talk about thinking big. Can't get much bigger than that. Robert Chilson put brains in their pockets. Hayford Pierce's sardonic and darkly humorous stories began showing up in 74. I once made a Pareto analysis of analog authors by frequency, that's what Pareto does. The basic principle is if you count the frequency in any fixed category, the most frequent appearing item will uh, be much greater than the second, third, fourth, and so on down. So the fewer, the bigger, or I should say the bigger, the fewer. In 1980 to 84, that was the Zahn Delaney era because Timothy Zahn accounted for 22 
of all the stories published in those couple of years. Joseph H. Delaney accounted for another 17. And after that came Ray Brown with 12, Harry Kavinikoff with eight, Edward Byers with eight, Lee Corey with eight, Charles Sheffield with seven, and so on down the list. I'm not gonna read everything here. In the next era, 1985-1988, by the way, I determined the years by how much of a turnover there was on the list. And usually very few of the people in one list carry over into the next list. And if they do, they're way down. So 85 to 88 was the Turtle Dove of Sheffield era. Harry Turtle Dove appeared 19 times, Charles Sheffield 15 times, Rob Chilson 12 times, and so on down the list. <coughs> Timothy Zahn was still there, but he only appeared nine times. Joseph Delaney was still there, but he only appeared seven times. And that was the last period in which they appeared in the Top Gun list. 1989 to 1992, <coughs> which was the last era that I defined here, I blush to call the thompson Ultian flynn era. Because <laughs> each of the three appeared 12 times. It was a tie. Ray <laughs> Rollins was in there 11 times, F. Alexander Retcha 10 times, Maya Catherine Bonhoff, nine times, and so on down the list. Of the top 22, the cutoff point was five appearances. That meant 22 people in that era. Uh, four of them are women. Maya Catherine Bonhoff, Lois McBaxter Bujol, Amy Bechtel, and Julia Eckler. <coughs> Indeed, giants walk the earth. I'm not one of the giants, although it may appear that way. <laughs> the earth trembles when I take a step. <laughs> In addition to the heavy hitters that I just mentioned, there are also a few who made only one or maybe a few appearances, but were mighty uh, in the land. Bob Shaw, with his remarkable story, Light of Other Days. And uh, David Palmer, with Emergence. Both of those stories had sequels years later, but the original story still stands out. Okay. Now, how did I get into analog? let alone on the list. By the way, how much time have I used up? Still got plenty of time. Yeah. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> I have no option but to believe you because there's no clock on the back wall. <laughs> and the only clocks around here are in places that I cannot see. <laughs> okay. When I was a kid, I sent stories to all the usual places. I didn't know about analog at that time. And uh, acquired a, a fair collection of forum rejection slips. After I discovered analog, I wrote a story up called Ashes and I sent it to John Campbell. And he replied with a two-page rejection letter, ripping my poor story to shreds and trampling them into the dust. I was devastated. <coughs> Little did I know that no editor would waste his time doing that, and that the letter actually meant, put these shreds back together in a more interesting fashion and try me again. 
Instead, I gave up writing. I was totally crushed. Also, I was going to college, so that was going to take up a lot of time. Should have taken up more time. <laughs> what can I say? And there it sat. Years went by. And then one day I ran across the story in the drawer and I read through it and I said, this sucks. <laughs> so I rewrote it, cutting large amounts of unsightly fat, tightening it up, as they always say. And I sent it in again to Anaheim. But by now, Ben Bovo was the editor. And he rejected it with a form letter. At least Campbell would give me two pages of soul crushing <laughs> critique. So back in the drawer it went. More time went on. Eventually, I was out of school and I was actually working for a living, getting paid for that. And I saw a magazine on the racks called Galileo, which I had never heard of before for good reasons. And they were running a contest for unpublished writers. The winner of which contest would get published. I said, cool, I certainly qualify. <laughs> so I wrote up a story called Slum Live. And I sent it to Charlie Ryan at Galileo. And he wrote back and said that he would not accept it for the contest. He wanted to put it in the magazine right off the bat. I said, okay. <laughs> but Galileo, in those days, and forever after, I suppose, paid on publication on um, acceptance. And the magazine went under before I got paid anything. So there it sat out there in limbo. Finally, when uh, Charlie Ryan had given up trying to sell a anthology of unpublished Galileo stories, I said, look, if one editor can be fooled into accepting this, <laughs> maybe I could cousin another ed editor. And so I sent to Analog, because by now, Stan Schmidt was it. And much to my delight and surprise, he accepted it. And that's how Slan Liu got to be my first published, uh, my, the first published story that I got paid for. I had a couple of short things in the high school literary magazine, but I was the editor of that. <laughs> <laughs> and so that really doesn't count. So that I thought, Ah, this is a good racket. Maybe I can get another story. And I remembered that story that Campbell had eviscerated. And I looked around and I found it, pulled out a drawer and read it again now, years later. And I said, this still sucks. <laughs> so I rewrote it again and sent it in. And the taste, literary taste that analog must have fallen so low <laughs> this story was finally deemed accepted. <laughs> I can only quote my brothers, who when Galileo went under with my story clenched in their tight little hands, suggested that Galileo went under because of <laughs> It's nice to have supportive family. <laughs> so that was my second story in hand. And I'm not going to go through the whole list. Shortly after, I sent two stories to Analog at the same time. That's a no-no. You really shouldn't do that. 
And I thought, he'll accept one and reject the other. And he did, except it was the other way around from what I was expecting. <laughs> and I said to him one time then at a party, I said, I thought you would accept the forest of time and reject I fly. And Stan said, that's why I'm the editor and they're only the writer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, both of them went on to make the Hugo list. Something that I didn't do for years afterwards, so it's just a fluke. Okay. He said I could spend 15 minutes reading a story. One suggestion was that I could read What's Wrong? Do I have time? I, th I think 15 minutes for a story would be fine. Okay. Because I'm supposed to allow time for questions. Like, what are you doing up there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. One suggestion was that I read from the story Nexus, which was a cover story a while back and featured a time traveler, an immortal, a resident alien living in secret on Earth, an invading monster from outer space, an android, and a telepath. I did not include the kitchen sink. <laughs> but I had the notion of these six different individuals, each doing their own thing for their own reasons, eventually colliding <coughs> and bouncing off one another. And that's what he did. So it could actually be said that Analog perhaps published perhaps the very first science fiction story based on Aristotelian metaphysics. <coughs> So there. <laughs> what I decided to read, however, or to inflict you with, is a currently unpublished story. Emphasis on currently unpublished. It's still in sort of a uh, <clears throat> rough form. In other words, it's not finished. It's called The Journeyman in the Ruins of Eobrog. There's an introductory quote. I long to journey endlessly, always in search of something new. And Nika via Matias. Gotta get new glasses or larger type. A strategic bluff. Theodoric, son of Nagarajan the Iron Hand, sat astride his horse in the fore of his regiment and studied on the situation before him. The Roy's own savage archers were arrayed on the extreme left of the Royal and Imperial Army of Cuffland, well placed for a sweep around the enemy's flank but that worked best where there were flanks around which to sweep. Not so well in facing the bluffs of Sinjin Trail, which shouldered over against the saltwater bay and blocked a direct route to the enemy capital. Teo did not believe there was worse ground for light cavalry anywhere in Yao Province. Most of the Cuffland Field Army was concentrated farther west, where the land flattened out and provided a more open, if more roundabout, route to the objective. Unfortunately, all the bridges across the river Seine had been blown down, and the Prawn Home Army was entrenched opposite Dolores Ford. That would have been a fine location for his regiment, with scoop for its special weapons and tactics, 
which raised the fascinating question of why the general had posted him here where his troopers were practically useless. Teo had lined up his regiment along and behind a low ridge, facing the bluffs across a scrubby flatland. The prawns had thoughtfully cleared this land of any obstacles and festooned it with distance markers for the artillery that crowned the heights. It was a good field for a cavalry charge. It would have been even better had it also been a killing field for artillery. Teo studied the obstacle carefully through his look glass. Okay, I give up. I'm going to sit down. Taylor studied the obstacle carefully through his look glass. It doesn't go all the way through, does it? He asked his assistant colonel, Mar Rio del Hemoy, that there canyon. It looks like it might, but I don't think it does. The Lars shook his head. The prawns were never much for sharing maps with us. Probably thought we would use them to invade their country someday. Tao chuckled. Do we at least know its name? They call it Belay de la Morth, the Valley of Death. Hello. <laughs> Taylor lowered his glass and looked at his number one, then glanced toward his chief of scouts, Sammy of the Eagles. Well, that can't be good. Why don't you scope it out over there on the left and see if there's a way around them bluffs? I'm somewhat mindful of charging down that there canyon with all them guns up on top. But, but might be trapped, the hillman answered. You think General were you in there? He wouldn't dare, said Larigo. It's near treason to throw away a regiment like that. Yeah, and it sort of makes me wishful of being around for the court martial. So that make you wishful, Sammy said, that you hadn't sampled his wife. A clatter of hooves announced the arrival of Jerry's son of Rondouge, the implacable. Like Teo, he had wandered out of the great grass in search of adventure, or at least to evade the price on his head. Jerry shoulders his <coughs> mount into line between Teo and Larigo and studied the bluffs. Finally, he spat on the ground and said, Tell me we ain't ordered to climb straight up them cliffs. We ain't ordered to climb straight up them cliffs. That's good. We'll be ordered to charge straight into that air canyon. Jerry pressed his lips, bobbed his head side to side. He wore a broad-brimmed plainsman's hat and doffed it to shade his eyes while he checked the sky overhead. Well, it's a good day for it anyway. A good day for what? asked Larigo. Jerry looked at him. For diamond. He seated his hat, adjusted it. When he was satisfied, he said, Hope she was worth it. That's my baby brother, said Morning Star Dora Ring, who also had joined the command group. Always poking into things without thinking it through. The Greenies were not accustomed to women in battle harness let alone such an exotic one as Teo's sister. Like Teo, the other plainsman, she was tall and bronze-skinned in contrast to the green-skinned cuffs and prawns here on East Continent. You gonna poke into that there canyon, he said, or she said, or are you gonna tell the Lar where he can poke it? What's the first rule of the hunt? Morning stool, morning star rule her eyes. Men. What's the first rule, Taylor insisted? She sighed. First bow is always right. First bow? asked Larigo. Yeah, 
you see on the great grass, whenever a group gets together for a hunt or a roundup or something, one of them gets named as first bug. And whatever he says goes. What if he makes a bad decision? Tao and Jerry and Morningstar exchange glances. Well, said Tao, that's the second rule. That's all I brought with me. that it took you an inordinate amount of time to publish your first story to becoming a major voice. Maybe for a young writer that would help that person if she knew that. I don't know that I ever did become a major voice. More of a voice crying in the wilderness. There was a time when I was invited to sit on con panels for new writers. It was probably about the time that he stopped inviting me that I figured that I was no longer a new writer. <laughs> Maybe the first couple Hugo nominations? That's possible. So that was like three or four years, I think. But I was that obnoxious guy on the panel who said, when they were discussing rejection slips, I would say, what's a rejection slip? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> the hate, the hate. <laughs> One time, though, I did get a rejection from no less than Dr. Schmidt. And there was a kind of rejection that said, you finally made it. Because what it said was, if I had gotten this story from a new writer, I would be very excited. But Mike <laughs> Flynn can do better. <laughs> <laughs> so he sent the story back. He said, what could I do? I did better. And he bought it. I once made the vow that I would publish every story I ever wrote, even if I had to rewrite the story from scratch, with new characters and a different plot. <laughs> I also wrote poems. I published three in the analog, not known in those days as a hotbed of poetry. And after my poems appeared, it was still not known. <laughs> I can still recite two of them. Can you hear them? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yes. After that lead up, yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Has poetry a place in science fiction? 
amidst the spaceships and the DNA? I think it does, at least that's my conviction. So put your rationality in play. Measure feet in meters. That will give them a proper scientific ambiance. The feet should have a natural logarithm. The images, atomic resonance. Above all else, use logic and deduction. Hypothesize, experiment by the hammer. You find it has an odd sort of seduction. Your battle cry, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> <laughs> The other one apparently has made it into fan lore. <clears throat> it was entitled, There's a Bimbo on the Cover of My Book. <laughs> Inspired by a remark of uh, Roger McBride <coughs> Allen at Icon one year, who had his new book, Ring of Charon, and there was a babe on the cover. And he said, there's nobody like that in the story. <laughs> The tough <laughs> cover art is supposed to sell books, not explain the story. So I was standing on the rail platform waiting to go back home. There's a bimbo in the cover of my book. It scans. There's a bimbo on the cover of my book. There's a bimbo on the cover of my book. She is dumb and she is sexy. She is nowhere in the text. She is a bimbo on the cover of my book. There's a Spatial monster on the cover of my book. There's a monster on the cover of my book. He is mean and he is hairy, but the stories aren't that scary. <laughs> There's a monster on the cover of my book. That was my book, actually. <laughs> There's a white male on the cover of my book. <laughs> There's a white male on the cover of my book. Though the heroine is black with Arctic custom slack, so there's a white male on the cover of my book. There's at least one other. There's a spaceship on the cover of my book. Ah, oh, you know my poem. <laughs> there's a spaceship on the cover of my book. There's a spaceship on the cover of my book. There is, the connection's very iffy, but if the story's skiffy, there will be a special <laughs> on the cover of the book. <laughs> I don't remember the third poem, <laughs> which was actually the first poem. What is entitled, The Engineer Discourses Upon His Love and used an Irish rhyme scheme in which the last syllable of one line rhymes with the first syllable of the next line. And it's just all full of pornographic engineering terminology. <laughs> <laughs> if I could name what charms me, I suppose, it would be her angle of repose. <laughs> bits and pieces, except the very fi final line, why he, he won't leave her despite their arguments, fights, and so forth, that he won't leave her. He says, because you see, I simply can't leave her. more questions? <laughs> After that? <laughs> Are you guys ready to go up to uh, the reception? More than ready. More than ready. <laughs> Please, just give a big round of applause.